That's so exciting and so great to see the internship starting up again. Really uh, looking forward to seeing what God does through each and every one of them. Also this week, as you've probably heard, we have a conference we're hosting. So starting on Tuesday, there will be 1,200 pastors gathering here uh, every day to be encouraged and to be built up and to encourage one another. So I just mentioned that so that you could be praying for us and for them as we host this conference. It's going to be a great week. Well, Mitchell Weeholt and I just got back from Kenya. It's my very first time there. Uh, we spent like nine days there. It was a short trip. We had 13 flights in nine days, which is hard to comprehend. But here's the miracle of it. Not a single delayed flight, not a single lost bag. I don't know if that's ever happened before. Like that. The other thing, whenever I do mission trips, I always tell people, God has a plan and we have a plan. Usually they're different, so you have to be flexible and go with God's plan. But what was interesting on this trip is God's plan and our plan seemed to be exactly the same. Everything just went perfectly well in terms of our mission and our hopes and our purpose. So thank you for your prayers while I was gone. You're going to hear more about it next month when we begin the arrival. This year we're doing the arrival in November instead of December. But I do want to tell you just a couple of things about it. Thank you for supporting missions and the arrival here at New Life. It really makes a difference. So we began our trip in Mombasa, and there is a missionary couple. They live in the old city of Mombasa, which is entirely Muslim. To their knowledge, they are the only Christians living in that city. They live across the street from a 15th century mosque. And they live less than a block away from an old Portuguese fort, which was used to, uh, to market slaves to the rest of the world. But there, less than a block away, is where they live and they have their home. And in their ministries, you, we've met women who've been freed from the slavery of poverty and spiritual darkness. And we saw the boys that they brought into their home off the streets who are experiencing that transformation as well. And then we went to Nairobi, where the largest slum in all of Africa exists. It's called Kabira. And just in this past year or so, New Life has been involved in building what's called a hope center in the middle of that slum. So all you see are tin roofs all around. Just I've been to a lot of slums in the world, and this is, this is one of the biggest and most dark in terms of its poverty and the difficulties that you encounter there. But because of your generosity, this building is going up. Ministries are already taking place there. It's incredible to see. Then we went to Mata. Some of you have been there. Well, this is a ministry New Life has been involved in for years. It's a home for discarded and orphaned children. They aren't brought just into an orphanage. They're brought into homes with house parents. And these kids are given an education. They're discipled. They have good health care. They have clean water. It's, they experienced the hope of Jesus, and it was just incredible to see and to be a part of that. And then we also went to a, a town called Lodwar, which is in northern Kenya, where drought and famish, and famine has impoverished these communities. Some of the, the, it's one of the poorest communities I've ever seen in the world, but the Turkana people there, through this ministry called Amani Collective, are experiencing love, laughter, work, ethical wages, clean water, and the hope of Jesus. So I was blown away by all these stories. You're going to hear some of them later on, like I said, in November. But I just want to encourage you, if you ever have some discretionary giving that you want to give to missions or to the arrival at New Life, I can say for certain, it's great to be able to give it directly to the field, no overhead, and to see change lives over and over and over again. So thank you for that. Thank you for allowing me to be a part of it. Well, for the past few weeks, we've been going through the book of Ephesians, this incredible book, beautiful, powerful book in the New Testament. The first three chapters show us what it means to be in Christ. That's what it describes, the spiritual transformation that Jesus has brought into each and every one of our lives. But then the second half of the book, chapters four through six, show us how we are now to live because of who we are in Christ. And that's what we're going to be looking at today. The behavioral transformation that we are called to walk out as Christians. Our behavior determines the quality of our relationships, and the quality of our relationships determines the quality of our lives. So think for a moment about who you were before you met Jesus. How much, yeah, some of you are like, oh, man. <laughs> How much of a difference has he made in your life? Would I have liked the old you? 
I don't think you would have liked the old me. <laughs> Actually, I don't think Heidi would have married the old me. <laughs> you know, and Jesus is supposed to make that kind of a difference in our lives. You know, before I, I believed in Jesus, before I met him, I was a very empty person. It was like I was trying to fill my life up with everything that I thought would make me happy or accepted. But the more of those things I dumped into my life, the more empty I felt. So I filled my life with achievements, and I felt like a failure. I filled my life with pleasure, but it turned into harm. I filled my life with people, but I ended up hurting those people and being hurt by them. But then I met Jesus, and everything changed in terms of who I was, in the core of my being. For sure, I did not become perfect. None of us do, not even close. But when we meet Jesus, we experience resurrection. We experience transformation. We experience forgiveness. We are made new. And because of that, my behaviors did change radically, but that process is continuing to this day. So let's begin by opening up our Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4, or if you have the app, open your smartphone to Ephesians 4. We're going to start in verse 17, and today I will be going unapologetically through quite a few verses in Scripture. There's something powerful about just the reading of Scripture, because when the Bible speaks, God speaks. Also, as I mentioned a few weeks ago, the book of Ephesians was sent to a church that didn't have a Bible. They, didn't, they weren't Jews. They didn't have the Old Testament. The Gospels had not yet been published. And so when Paul sent them this letter from prison, he was giving them pretty much everything he thought they would need to know to live their life out in Christ. And so in this section, he really goes through a lot of behavioral changes and he leaves no stone unturned as he goes through this list. So let's take a look at the first part of it. Verse 17, he says, so I tell you this and I insist on it in the Lord that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. This term Gentiles, it means non-Jews, but really he means um, those who are without Christ, those who are ungodly must no longer live like they do in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they've given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity, and they are full of greed. That, however, is not the way of life that you learned when you heard about Christ and we're taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. So he begins by saying we must no longer live as the world lives in their darkened understanding. So there is supposed to be a transformation in how we live. Well, Heidi and I enjoy exploring caves. We've been to at least a half dozen caves just to, you know, on vacation, go and check them out. You could say we enjoy spelunking. I just had to use that word, spelunking. You look it up. Look up spelunking. We're amateur spelunkers. But we heard about a cave in Northern California that had a large stream flowing through it, a limestone cave. And I heard that you could actually literally float through this cave if you had an inner tube or a kayak or an air mattress. And so we were down there at a Christian camp just outside of Sonora. And we had a little bit of free time, so we said to our friends, let's go do it. And it was one of these places where they don't have like a parks office, they don't have a gift shop. I mean, it was, you just had to know where this place was. It's called Natural Bridges. Our intern's been there, right? You guys have been there. So a couple people have been there, but not many people have been to this place. I've got a couple pictures. I don't know if they've shown them on the screen yet, but that's what it looks like. And so it was 100 degrees Fahrenheit out, and so my friends and Heidi and I, we hiked down through the heat, it's about a two mile hike down to the stream as it enters this cave. And we didn't all wanna just go wade into it. We didn't have any floaties, we didn't have any inner tubes, so we were gonna wade into it or swim into it. And it was kinda cold, so they're like, well, Matt, why don't you go first? So, <laughs> so I waded into it and you know, it got deeper and deeper until pretty soon there were some times when I'd have to swim a little bit and then I'd find my way to the edge where there was some mud on the bottom I go deeper and deeper into this cave until it's starting to get pretty dark. And then I look into like this crevasse at the side of the cave. I don't have a headlamp or anything like that. And I see a face looking back at me. There's a person in there. Like, and 
it was weird because I didn't hear there was nobody else in there, but there is this person. And so I was like, hey, like, are you okay? And this person's like, no. They, they, I don't even think they said no, just kind of, sh she shook her head, it was a woman. And so I, I kind of side stroked over there and she was clutching onto an inner tube. And as far as I could tell, she was like having a panic attack by herself in the dark, in this cave, frozen in terror without any help. I don't know how long she'd been there. I paddled over there. I said, I think you're gonna be okay. You're gonna be okay. Are you okay? <laughs> and she's like, as soon as I got close to her, I could smell the alcohol. Like she was obviously had had a lot <laughs> to smell that way. And so I just realized she was in bad shape in more ways than one. So I said, all right, I, we can go out of this. You can get out of this. And so I just grabbed onto her inner tube and began to pull her out and begin to side stroke out of the cave. I said, pretty soon, you're gonna be able to put your feet down. It gets shallower, just, you can do this. And so we work our way out to the sun. I don't know what Heidi and our friends were thinking, like, what's happening? Where'd Matt go? When's he coming back? So I come out pulling this lady into the shore and, and then it was just a really weird experience. Okay? She gets out off the inner tube. She goes up on the opposite bank of the shore and I look up and there's a man standing there. And this man has cut off jeans and no shirt on and a Nazi swastika tattooed to his chest. And she walks over to him, that's her friend, I guess. And I'm just like, what is happening here? I just said, bye, <laughs> you know, like, I was able to help for the moment, you know, but she just went off and I went over to our friends. So I'm like, oh yeah, we can go into that cave a little ways, we ended up doing that. But then as we're coming back out, I look over there again and I see them, they've got like some surgical tubing and they're like literally like, cutting off their arm uh, circulation so they can shoot up with like heroin. And just in that moment, I thought, this is darkness. This is literal darkness, and this is spiritual darkness. It was a strange, disturbing experience. I can't tell you it had this great ending to it. I helped her for a moment, and that's a good thing. But it, it really is illustrated to me the desperate condition that people are in without the Lord. Stuck in darkness, trapped in actions that have them enslaved. And that darkness looks different for every person. It hides itself well. It doesn't always look like what I encountered in that cave. It could be the stay-at-home mom who's drinking herself to death. And there's no positive outcome unless things change, and unless there is a turnaround. And we could think of a million other scenarios like that. The people around you without Jesus need what you have more than you know. Life outside of Jesus is described here as being futile. That's the word that's used. That there's a futility to it, which means you're pursuing but not attaining. You're going after things, but you're not experiencing them. Life without the influence of Jesus causes us, it mentions it here in this text, to become callous. The hardening of the heart, losing all sensitivity through repeated pressure over and over again. Over time, through repeated sin, we become desensitized. We become numb. We try to detach emotionally from the pain of our world that we experience and that we cause, and before long, we feel nothing. We're shocked at nothing. Our emotions flatline. We require greater and greater stimulation to feel anything. This is a condition of the world. And many churchgoers are also in this condition. If we try to serve God on our own terms, if we stop surrendering to the lordship of Jesus, I would say even if we stop living a life of repentance, which is an ongoing activity, you'll never get to the place in your Christianity where you have to stop that process. But if you do, then you'll end up going down that kind of a road. So don't be shocked. As I look at this first part of this passage, don't be shocked when unbelievers act like unbelievers. I just want to throw this out there. Don't be surprised when sinners celebrate sin. Often Christians are shocked when non-Christians don't share our values. Why don't they let us pray before classes at school or in public gatherings? Well, it's because they don't believe in prayer. That's why. <laughs> they were like, why waste your time? Why do they teach evolution in the school? Well, because they don't have any other explanation. Why are they sending confusing messages about identity to our children? Because they're confused. We expect them to live like us, but that's never going to happen until they meet Jesus. And so instead of trying to change the behavior of those around us, it's our job to introduce people to Jesus. This can happen when we live life in the light. 
See, being a Christian is not about behavior modification. That would be religion or ethics. But being a Christian is about identity transformation. It's about stepping into who we are in Christ. God gives us a new heart, replacing the desensitized, calloused heart with a soft heart that gives us a greater sensitivity to people and a greater empathy for those who are suffering. He goes on to describe this process of the heart change in verse 22. So here's this one of these lists. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, your old self which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and instead speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. That's a good command. Do not give the devil a foothold. Anyone who has been stealing must no longer steal, but must work doing something useful with their hands, that they may have something to share with those in need. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. I was like, this is a long list. What's malice? Anybody know what malice is? I was like, what's malice? I don't really know the definition of malice. Sounds bad. So I looked it up. The Greek word for malice, it's interesting. It's, it's Kakia, which is a Greek goddess who was the goddess of vice, sin, and moral badness, evil, and depravity. So got to get rid of that. <laughs> All this stuff. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. So this section gives us this list of stark contrasts. We put off certain things, we put on certain things. Put off certain things that are sinful, put on certain things that reflect love. Spiritual conversion is followed by daily conversion. Or let me explain it in theological terms. So there's this process of sanctification that Christians go through. What is sanctification? Sanctification, by definition, is the process of being set apart. The word holy, what it means is it means set apart for a purpose for God. Sanctification is the process of being set apart for a purpose for God. And it's something we all go through, the sanctification process. It happens instantaneously with positional sanctification. What that means is when I become a Christian, I am now in Christ, seated with Jesus. I experience his righteousness, his forgiveness. I'm at peace with God. I have salvation, all those things. Positional sanctification is instantaneous. But then progressive sanctification is now dealing with the remnants of sin in my life and beginning to walk out that righteousness, learning to live in it, learning to live differently in Christ. And so put off your old self, lay aside the former ways of living, put on your new self, meant to be righteous and holy, the new person who you now are, according to God, is good, holy, righteous. We're now trying to live up to who we are in Christ. He says here, put off falsehood, lying, self-deception, put on truth, put off anger, and put on peace. I like this verse that says, do not let the sun go down on your wrath. That's something Heidi and I have tried to live out in our marriage. We've probably only had a few nights where we went to bed angry <laughs> at each other, maybe just a few. It's a good marriage principle, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. But it's not just a good marriage principle, it's a good life principle for all relationships. Put off stealing and put on generosity. He says, put off filthy talk, hurtful words, and instead put on encouragement. When I looked at that part of this passage, I thought to myself of like, my tendency with my words used in a harmful way, especially before I was a Christian, was I would put people down. If, if not verbally, at least in my mind. But as a Christian, we have to put that off. Some of you are really good at sarcasm. Some of you might be really good in terms of your sense of humor at, at belittling others. But as a Christian in Christ, we put aside those abilities and tendencies and natural tendencies, and we put on the ability to encourage others, lift others up, and see the best that's in them. And so it is put, on, put off self-centeredness, put on the Holy Spirit, put off fighting, and passive aggressive behavior, instead be kind and compassionate and forgiving. Is there anything specific here that speaks to you that you need to do or change? 
Hear the Lord's voice through his word as he calls you to change that behavior. You know, the old me was about me. And even now, if I could, you know, the old me is still present. The old you is still present. He's still there lurking in the shadows of your heart. And we have to make that choice on who we're going to live to be, the new me or the old me. If I was the old me, I would probably just do what I want to do. Like for me, my week would be pleasure. I think my natural tendency is towards hedonism, which is the pursuit of pleasure. So a never-ending vacation. Golf one day, fish the next, disc golf the next, hike and backpack the next, surf the next day, kayak the next day, Netflix binge the next day, food tour the next day, right? That would be the great dream in my mind. Like that would be it. That would be the selfish way to live. Totally turned inward, the pursuit of pleasure. But God has called us to do more than pursue pleasure. And that if we pursue pleasure, again, it leaves us feeling empty. But when we serve others, when we embrace the call of God on our lives, when we walk in the gifts, when we see that there's more to this life than just having fun, then we will experience joy, a joy that far outweighs living selfishly. So confront and replace the old you with the new you. Okay, one more section. And again, Ephesians, he's laying out, I think, all these commands. Because again, he just wants to make sure these guys get it, that they aren't to be content with who they've been. So verse 1 of chapter 5, follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But among you, there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. Not even a hint of, so this is tough commands. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a person as an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them. And so if you struggle with any of these things that I just read, I want to encourage you, you are not those things. You're not the things that you struggle with. They're, they no longer define you in Christ. Verse 8, you were once darkness, but now you're light in the Lord. Live as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists of all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Find out what pleases the Lord and have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. I just want to pause there. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. This doesn't mean we're the mor morality police. No. It means that when you're around dark actions or behaviors, let your light shine. Let there be a, a contrast. Flood the darkness with the light of God's presence and love. Verse 12, it's shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret, but everything exposed by the light becomes visible, and everything that is illuminated becomes a light. That's why it is said, wake up, sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord. Always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, when you read this long section of actions and ethics and behaviors, the message is clear that our actions speak louder than our words. Let your life speak. You may have heard this said before, but it's been said to preach the gospel at all times, use words when necessary. St. Francis of C.C is attributed to have said that. But let our lives proclaim the goodness of God and the truth of who he is. And also, when I look at this passage, it just really shines the light on my heart to not be complacent with any behavioral struggles, any sin in my own life. And everyone has them, whether it's lust or laziness, anger or apathy, gossip or greed. Remember, we're not who we once were. We're called to a higher standard. And our character is what gives us credibility. Our integrity is what will make or break our witness. We live in a time where there's an obvious lack of integrity 
among politicians, right? That's what we hear all the time. That's what people like to point out. Or in secular leaders or even in church leaders, a lack of integrity or a lack of character makes headlines. But the witness of your life will come from congruence to God's word, the ability to love well, to care well, to align our lives with a way that honors God in the way that we behave. Integrity is who we are when no one else is around. And this passage urges us to replace the behaviors of darkness with the actions of the light. Maybe you hear this and, and think, man, Matt, I've got a lot of work to do. Well, that's perfect. That is the best place to start. A healthy part of every Christian, Christian's life has to do with repentance. And repentance is not mere regret. It's a radical change of behavior. It's an about face. And so that's why this passage says, replace these things with these things. Replace greed with generosity, anger with peace, hatred with love, intoxication with being filled with the Spirit. It's that replacing and that changing and that transforming. And you know, that's one thing about preaching God's Word. When you preach God's Word, you can't avoid passages like this. This is why we like to go through books of the Bible at certain times. This is the kind of passage some pastors would be like, I don't know if I really want to talk about sin, you know, like it might make people uncomfortable. Well, God wants us to be uncomfortable with our sin because he wants what's best for us. So learning to repent, becoming comfortable with that, owning it, you know, and that as a, as a Christian in Christ, we are still a work in progress. And it's easy to judge others. Some people have abandoned their faith because they've seen their heroes fall or their mentors stumble and disappoint. But let's not judge them. Let's not judge others. Let's learn to change ourselves with God's help. Righteous behavior ultimately has an outward focus. There have been times when I've looked inward to try to change who I am. But if you're going to walk in a godly way, it means taking our focus off of ourselves and onto others. It's how we see others. It's how our behavior affects others. It's about how we live and love together in Christ. So righteousness is technically impossible, but the Lord wants to give it to us. And then we have to learn how to walk in it. So my challenge for you today is to become the new you. May we live in that. What if instead of focusing on getting ahead every single day, I look for ways of loving people every single day? What if instead of looking down on others, instead I express compassion to those around me who are struggling? What if instead of letting my sinful nature lead me or control me, I walked in the spirit and in worship? What if we didn't need to numb or mask the stress of every day, but instead we were free, filled with the spirit, receiving from him? And what if we could be a community that is real, not hypocritical, but genuine, not perfect, but growing, not looking down on others, but compassionate? Not like the world around us, but content, thankful, and generous. You know, as we strive to live that way, as we become those kinds of people, this is like music to God's ears. That's how this passage ends. Our conversations will be like psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs of the Spirit, making music in the ears of the Lord. Music to those who are around us. Our conversations would be like beautiful songs. Our fellowship would be like the sounds of worship in the ears of God. And so today, as we respond to God's word, we're gonna conclude this time by having communion together, which I think is a perfect place to go after a message like this. If you didn't receive communion when you came in, there are communion cups and bread back at the exits. If you're watching online, go and grab something, some bread or some crackers and some juice. Now let's just take this moment to do a, a little self-evaluation, a little inventory, and bring our hearts to, to the Lord. And you can go ahead and open your communion cup, take the bread out right now. And Jesus, as we hold this bread in our hands, we're reminded of the cross. This represents your body. And it was our sins that took you to the cross, that held you to the cross, that you bore upon yourself and I thank you, Lord God, that you did that because you love us. I thank you, Lord, that you did that so that we wouldn't be bound by our sins, so that we wouldn't have to carry our sins, which we cannot carry. 
Thank you for your love, Lord, that was expressed so that we might be forgiven, that nothing that we've ever done would be a surprise to you or too much for you. Lord, in this moment right now, we just bring you our old man, the old woman, the old person that we were in our current struggles, and we ask for your forgiveness. Thank you for your love. Thank you for paying that price. We don't take it lightly. We turn to you and we ask for your help that we could walk as people who are in Christ, made new through the power of your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Go ahead and eat the bread in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Okay. And Lord, as we hold these cups representing your blood, Lord, I thank you that we are cleansed by the blood of Jesus, that it covers over our sin. We thank you for that. We receive that. If you're here today and you feel far from God, or maybe you've never accepted Jesus Christ into your life as your Lord and Savior, I encourage you to do so right now, that he offers you life, he offers you forgiveness, he offers you transformation. It's not about trying harder, it's about receiving that gift that he has for you. And so, Lord, we all receive this gift of your life that comes to us through your shed blood. Lord, make us new again. We commit our future to you again. We surrender our lives to you again. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Go ahead and take the juice, receive that. And let's conclude our service by standing together. We're going to worship the Lord with this song. Let it be a declaration of your commitment to him, your faith in him.
Amen. Well, we want to thank you for being here today at New Life Church. If you're needing prayer for any reason, we'll have our prayer team up here uh, to pray for you. So if that's you today, uh, come forward to receive prayer. In addition to that, as a reminder, today after our second service is the info meeting for the Mexico mission trip. If that's something that you want to attend to get more info on, uh, you're welcome to, to do that today. But with that, have a great day and we'll see you soon. God bless you all.